coming up on Great Lakes Now. Unearthing prehistoric artifacts to expose the Great Lakes region's earliest human inhabitants. Oh, there it is. This is our first artifact of the day. What do we do with water that doesn't go over Niagara Falls? We take water out of the Niagara River and we turn that hydropower into electricity. And news from around the lakes. Well, hello and welcome to another Great Lakes Now episode premiere party. I'm Anna Seisling, host of Great Lakes Now, and I really appreciate you tuning in as we learn about some really interesting archaeological findings throughout the Great Lakes region during our premiere party for tonight. I also want to make sure that I welcome our other cross posters and co-hosts who are streaming this event. So we've got a really great lineup of some pretty knowledgeable guests who are going to be joining us a little bit later in the walk party and they are going to answer all of your burning questions about all things archaeology all throughout the Great Lakes region and as always you know I'm excited to bring your voice into the conversation so please let us know where you're watching from what your name is and obviously if you have any questions about archaeology fossils bones maybe you found something in the Great Lakes region and you're wondering what it is where you might be able to take it to, to get it identified. You can drop all that good stuff into the chat and know that I will get to it and work it into the conversation as we go. But before we get into any of that, let's check out the featured segment from the latest episode of Great Lakes Now. The word archeology span might make you think of the Egyptian pyramids, but in our own region, archeologists are uncovering evidence of human activity thousands of years before the pyramids were built. Till the head up. To be an archaeologist, it takes a lot of precise measuring. Shooting. Got it. A lot of scraping. And a lot of sifting. There's a reason for all this hard work. These archaeologists are looking for the tiniest bits of evidence of ancient civilizations. I like to spread the rocks out so you can see, sort of see each one. That's Brendan Nash, a doctoral student of archaeology at the University of Michigan. So what we're looking for in here are the tiniest little flakes, debris from the manufacture of stone tools. This dig site is in the middle of a farmer's field in southwest Michigan. You know, this was a outwash plain. The water from the glaciers was sort of poured out for thousands of years, channeled, you know, down past this area and left just innumerable little pebbles and stones, some of which are really high quality chert. Chert is a sedimentary rock that was key to the existence of people who occupied this land about 13,000 years ago. It has two basic properties which make it useful for manufacturing stone tools. It breaks with a smooth fracture to form very sharp edges, and it's very durable, perfect for making sharp tools and spear points for hunting. They were called Clovis points. The people who made them and used them for hunting are called Clovis people after Clovis, New Mexico, where artifacts like these were found in the 1930s. We know the site was visited at least twice by Clovis groups, may have been as many as four or five. The person who discovered this site and brought it to the attention of the archaeology department at the University of Michigan is a self-taught archaeologist named Tom Talbot. He grew up around here and now lives in Minden, Michigan. I was born, oh, probably about three miles southwest of here. Tom spent a lot of time on his grandparents' farm, exploring the neighboring fields in St. Joseph County. At just 11 years old, he discovered his life's passion. I had a friend whose father worked in soil conservation, and uh, he would collect arrowheads and, and flint knives and stuff and bring them home. So at 11 years old, he showed me what to look for as far as uh, some of the signs that these people left behind. What young Tom found while exploring the fields around him were pieces of rock, just little chips and flakes. I went back and found some heat fractured rock on a little sandy hill next to this marsh and started walking around. And I picked up like two arrow points and a couple of flint knives, some broken pieces. You know, that was thrilling uh, to be able to 
actually go out and find a village site on my own. Talbot lives in a house not far from the dig site. An entire room in Tom's house has been converted into his archaeology lab. He uses a powerful microscope, coupled with his cell phone, to zoom in to an arrowhead made from chert for a closer look. So all the constituents are here for, uh, for a good view of what Attica chert looks like. Attica chert is usually found about 150 miles southwest of this dig site near the Indiana-Illinois border. So the question that Tom and his fellow archaeologists had to grapple with was, how and why did it end up here? It's believed that Clovis people in search of game migrated to this area about 13,000 years ago during the Pleistocene era, commonly referred to as the Ice Age. They set up camp, manufactured and sharpened their hunting tools in what is now this farmer's field in St. Joseph County. Tom uses a 3D printed copy of a Clovis spear point to show the detail of how they were made. You know, you can see the fluting here. That was done and to put it on the handle or shaft. I believe they did a dual or multi-purpose half day. Um, so instead of, instead of putting the, this point on, on a shaft of a spear, they would mount it on a hollowed out piece of bone. Guy could have several of these hanging from his hunting belt, put it on the spear. This particular dig site is called the Belson site, named for the family that owns this farmland. It's a significant discovery. The Clovis culture has been studied in the southwest and southeastern United States, but the Belson site is the oldest Clovis site ever discovered in Michigan. Talbot and archaeologists from the University of Michigan have been digging at the Belson site for the past four years. In Clovis times, we think, if you can correct me if I'm wrong, yeah, this is sort of an open grassland, sort of like a, like a savanna. And at some point, uh, a mixed hardwood forest came in and put roots through essentially the entire area here. So that's a major source of disturbance, and we can see the roots in the undisturbed sediment. It's tedious work, scraping and then sifting through the dirt to find tiny fragments of rock that offer clues about what happened on this spot thousands of years ago. The dig site is carefully measured out in one meter square sections. Dr. Henry Wright, anthropology professor at U of M, has been leading digs like this around the world for many years. Well, we had a large concentration of material at the surface level. This has been mapped already. Brendan has done a really nice statistical study of the surface and the immediately subsurface level. And so we have a, a continuous dense scatter of these small, tiny flakes from the activities of Paleo-Indians. And we're right in a very interesting part of that area. So we're hoping to see uh, exciting finds. And then a discovery. There it is a tiny fragment of stone. This is our first artifact of the day. This is a small flake from the refurbishment of a Clovis spear point. So you can imagine when you're resharpening a stone tool, you have to shave down the edge all the way after it breaks to reform it into a point. And when you do that, you end up with a whole bunch of little extra pieces of debris, which is what we have here. I am looking to see if this chert is familiar enough to me to identify it with just the naked eye almost looks like Wyandotte Church from all the way down to the very bottom of Indiana on the Ohio River, but I'm gonna go ahead and set up my microscope and, and look at it a little further. There's some curious aspects to it that I'd like to see. Under further inspection, under my microscope here, it's actually Muldruff Church. Muldruff Church comes from hundreds of miles away, suggesting that people moved or traded over long distances in this region 13,000 years ago. This fragment also seems to have been modified with fire to make the hard chert easier to work. Chert are more useful if they heat treat it. And they bring it up uh, very slowly in sand. They bring it up to several hundred degrees and then let it cool down naturally. After taking a few measurements, the Belson site crew calls it a day and covers up the site with tarps. Next stop, the lab. 
Well, yesterday we were out at the Belson site, excavating and mapping pieces of cultural debris. And today we're analyzing and cataloging all of that material that we excavated yesterday. Tom determines what kind of stone it is. I determine a technologic category to put it in. All the data that's collected is used to create a 3D map of the Belson site. So what we have here is a three-dimensional data map of the Belson excavation. Each blue dot is a flake. Each green dot is a C14 sample to send off for radiocarbon. And our red dots are our formal tools. And we see a strong central cluster that we believe is a dugout heating feature, maybe the first Clovis hearth to ever be found. And when we look at it in profile, we see a real nice line in the profile. So this is the elevation at which they were living. We are quite certain that these flakes have undergone no transport since deposition. They are sharp and they will cut you. After 13,000 years, they will still cut you. One by one, each specimen is carefully examined. Okay, what I'm looking for first is the point from which this thing was struck. And I can see a little platform right here. And it's a prepared platform. It appears to be ground a little bit, which is typical. Talbot says he's in his element working alongside professors in the lab, despite his lack of formal training in archaeology. But it's out in the field, working under the hot sun at the Belson site, that stirs up memories of how his life's work began as a curious kid exploring his own neighborhood. I do remember standing on a sand hill looking over a marsh, and it turned out it was just on the other side where the Belson site was discovered, thinking that someday I would make a significant contribution to the archaeological history. And then that, that happened. <laughs> All right, so before we start unpacking everything that we just saw in that segment, I wanna make sure that we drop a link to the January landing page for our latest January episode. Uh, when you check that out, hopefully after the episode premiere party, you can look at uh, all the different segments and links to related content that are over at greatlakesnow.org related to that segment and others. And before we get into introducing our guests, I also wanna make sure that I point out that Great Lakes Now always creates lesson plans uh, that are based on the segment you just saw and other segments for our monthly show. You can find uh, all of the lesson plans, uh, including the one for this month's show, over at greatlakesnow.org slash education. And before we get to our guests, I just want to point out things are going gangbusters in the chat right now. We have a lot of people tuned in from all over the place. So I just want to give some people a shout out before we dive into the conversation. We have Sandra, who is tuned in, in uh, from Austin. We have Jan in Marquette, Michigan, Matthew in Ann Arbor. We have Joe Murray in Rochester Hills, Michigan. We have Heather in Grass Lake. We have Jim in Salina, Ohio. We've got Debbie in Toledo, Tony in Greenwood, Indiana, Laura in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We've got Betsy in Traverse City, Michigan, Charlene in Beach Grove, Indiana, Tony in Kalamazoo, Andrea in Clinton Township, Michigan. We have Andrew in the Keweenaw Peninsula of Michigan. We have Penny in White Pigeon, Michigan. Gary J. Miller is from Vicksburg, Michigan, but is watching from Orange Beach, Alabama. Love that. And Ka uh, Kathleen is in Lakeview, Michigan. Becky uh, grew up in St. Joan, Michigan, but is now living in a Cleveland, Ohio suburb. We've got Sean in Sauters, Granada. We've got Joe in Almina, Michigan. Matthew Brown is giving it up for everybody in that story. He says, let's go, Tom. Let's go, Brendan. Michael in Niles, Michigan. Elizabeth in Ann Arbor, Michigan. We've got Meg in Sherwood, Michigan. Uh, we've got Sally in Davison, Michigan. We've got Gina in Limestone, Michigan. Uh, and we've got Rich in St. Clair Shores, Michigan. Matthew also says, let's go, Dr. Henry Wright. All right. So keep those coming for me. Let me know where you're tuned in from. And of course, if you have any questions or comments, about archaeology, about that really cool story about the archaeological dig happening in Southwest Michigan. You can drop your comments and questions into the chat. And I have a couple of really great guests who are more than qualified to answer all of your questions about these things. You might recognize them from the segment that we just saw. First up, we have University of Michigan archaeologist Brendan Nash joining us. And we also have Tom Talbot, who is the self-taught researcher who found the first Clovis Spear Point back in 2008. And you just saw Tom in that segment. You just saw Brendan Brendan as well. Thank you both uh, so much for joining. Thank you. You're welcome. 
Absolutely. Fantastic video. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah. It was a really, really fun story to tell. Um, and we have actually a comment coming in. Well, we have Craig from Falls Church, Virginia. Uh, and Joshua has a question. Is the Benson, uh, the Belson site, the oldest, earliest documented site in Michigan? Brendan, I'll put that first one to you. You know, yes, that's uh, that's what we think. You know, a lot of the significance is, is that it appears to be the oldest site in Michigan so far. Um, it's not impossible that there are older sites out there, but as far as we can tell, uh, this seems to be the oldest one. Okay. And I think, Tom, you really, uh, I think, sort of represent and symbolize a sort of like, um, I don't know, something special and kind of like a, a grit and determination as far as you being a self-taught archaeologist. So I want to ask you, you know, kind of going back in time a little bit, can you walk us through how you first realized that you were finding things that might actually be of like, archaeological and historical um, significance and importance um, in terms of sort of archaeology? And at what point did you decide, like, maybe I should bring in the U of M folks? Well, um, I actually started, uh, as the segment showed, uh, at 11 years old, and I was able to uh, identify washed out fire pits and identify some of the chips and flakes that were seen in the segment. Um, the Belson site itself, uh, for a long period of time, I was studying the site because it has a really strong representation of a late archaic site a little over 4,000 years ago. Um, and I was actually more looking for things like that when the first Clovis material started turning up. Um, but, you know, I decided as quite a young man that this was going to be more than a hobby. Um, mm -hmm. Recently retired and uh, I'm, uh, I'm about as deep into it as you can get. Uh, we're still working, uh, doing surface finds around the area uh, that's local to Belson and working in the lab. Uh, going through the data that we collect, the data that we've collected from the previous year. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I've jumped right into it. So, Cool. Um, we have a question. Well, we have Rick who says that was a great segment. I love it, Rick. Thanks for the love. Um, Damien, though, has a question, and I think I'll put this one to Brendan. Uh, Damien says, what kind of animal remains were found in context with the artifacts? Curious what groups may have been hunting and eating in Michigan during the last ice age. Sure. Well, you know, typically at Clovis sites, uh, they're big hunters. You find lots of animal bones, uh, Pleistocene animal bones, mammoth, horse, camel. A lot of people didn't know they were here in the late Pleistocene. But interestingly, at Belson, we seem to have some sort of uh, acidic soil issue, and we've got no actual faunal remains yet recovered from the site. And we've dug quite a bit, so we know that um, they probably just aren't there. But uh, what we do have are some analysis analyses of ancient proteins. Uh, recent techniques allow us to, um, well, a laboratory in Colorado, to extract proteins from the edges of stone tools uh, that actually are from the animals that uh, they were used to butcher. So based on that evidence, we've got uh, things that everybody would, would assume. So we've got rabbit, pig, and what is probably muxox uh, protein. Although interestingly, that protein is a fairly generic one, and it could be a whole slew of other animals as well. Um, but yeah, uh, wild hare and, of course, peccary would be the, the pig of the Pleistocene. Okay. All right. Um, we have a question. If I, could, if I could just add to that. Oh, uh, of course. Yeah. The, um, this is a Brunson series, sandy loam soil. Uh, the different sandy loam soils on the outwash plains um, down here in southwest Michigan, as Brendan pointed out, are really acidy soils. So um, any kind of bone or, um, well, basically any kind of organic material at all, uh, it gets eaten up. You know, it might last 1,500 years, 2,000 years tops. Um, and then it's all gone. Uh, we do have um, the possibility of, of charcoal to date to site. Uh, we haven't had anything dated back quite that far, but we've dated some back to uh, uh, early archaic, about 9,000 years. Uh, but we're still dating and uh, still hoping we can recover something organic that can put a, a definite date to the site. 
Uh, at present, we're, we're dating the site by the stone technology, thanks mm -hmm. to Brendan's expertise in that field. So, Okay. Um, and Tom, I'll stick with you. We've got some really thoughtful um, questions coming in from our audience. Uh, Rick wants to know, what kind of climate conditions did Clovis people experience 13,000 years ago? There were still glaciers over some of North America at that time. So um, yeah, Tom, I wonder if you have any insight into sort of what, what things, what the land looked like at that time for the people who were walking on it. Great question. Um, yes, this is still, the 13,000 year mark is still considered uh, uh, an ice age, a place to seem environment. The glacier had moved uh, way back upstate by then. The grasslands had taken over in the area and uh, the first trees were uh, spruce and some poplars. So the name for that particular ecosystem is spruce parkland. Uh, like you say, the, the grasslands had, had taken over spruce and poplar. So it gives you a little bit of an idea of what the environment looked like. Um, openings of grass and spruce trees and such. Okay. A lot of ponded marsh areas as well. Okay. Um, and I want to make sure, too, that I'm continuing to give everybody a shout out who's letting us know where they're watching from. So we've got Elizabeth, who is watching in Granger, Indiana. We've got Jim in Appleton, Wisconsin. We've got Sue in Gulfport, Florida. And we've got Marianne tuned in in Minnesota. Oh, and we've also got Tony in Otsego, Michigan. Um, so, Brendan, I want to go back to you now. We have another question coming in, this time from Jim Kralik, who says, uh, any Clovis associated with megafauna kills? Any evidence of that? Well, you know, not at our particular site, although with Clovis, that's generally very common. I think a lot of what brought archaeologists to Clovis in the first place back in the, in the 30s was the fact that it was often associated with big mammoth bones. Uh, so they were very conspicuous on the landscape and really gave Clovis a, uh, a persona as uh, big game hunters. Uh, but like we had just talked about, uh, we have evidence of them hunting sort of everyday game, rabbit, mm -hmm. uh, pig, um, and maybe even muck socks or a wild sheep if they were around. So we don't have megafauna kill at our site, uh, but that is typically associated with Clovis at other sites. Okay. Um, and we have a question coming in from Andrew Rabbit Island. Andrew uh, wants to know, how do these discoveries add to the wider understanding of migration patterns of prehistoric people? Does it add or undermine any previous research or conclusions about their movements in a significant way? Um, Brendan, maybe I'll, I'll give you first crack at that one. Uh, sure. Well, Tom can talk a little bit about our stone sourcing, and that's our major evidence uh, for movement. Um, and just to some, we're essentially, we're really confirming a, what a lot of other Clovis archaeologists have found. Um, these people are traveling long distances, carrying rather large stone tools and resharpening them along the way as they use them. So it really serves to confirm a lot of what we already knew about Clovis. Mm, okay. Yeah, Tom, I would love to hear a little bit on your thoughts on this too. Yeah, there is... Um other sites that date back to this particular time that are found uh, in uh, southwestern Illinois uh, that appear to be using uh, the same type of shirt. And the curious thing about this um, and these sites, like Belson, they're preferring that particular material and they're walking back and forth to the site from these little satellite hunting camps. Quite often they're walking past and sometimes through perfectly good church sources, and they're they're leaving it alone. Uh, we think that's an indication that they're using the, the stone source itself as a social, social, cultural, even a spiritual environment and a place, place to gather. Um, we had thought originally that by the time this particular stone tool, stone tool technology had reached the Great Lakes Basin that had kind of morphed into the next step, a, a point that we call Ganey. Um, but uh, that's why Clovis wasn't really expected to ever be found here. Uh, mm -hmm. But the find does kind of upend uh, that theory a little bit. But mm -hmm. being able to source and identify the stone types speaks to the mobility of these ancient people. It's really fascinating when you get into it. 
Absolutely. So we have a question coming in from Craig who says, is the paleo layer below the plow zone? If so, is it a well-defined stratified site? Um, Tom, I'll, I'll keep on you for that one. I am going to, uh, is it a topic I do know quite a bit about, but I'm going to defer to Brendan. He can really right. describe this much better. Okay. Uh, yeah. In short, there is um, stratified Clovis material below the plow zone in a largely undisturbed context. So that's, uh, that's really why we're spending so much time there uh, is because these pieces of stone are right where they were dropped 13,000 years ago. And we can really start to piece out where specific activities on the site were occurring. And you can, you can track the movement of people you know, around the site uh, at a basic level. So it's really an exciting window into this time period that you don't often get. Mm, absolutely. Um, Andrew says, very cool that the sites may have become cultural and spiritual spaces of significance. We also have uh, Cassandra in Newton Falls, Ohio, Wendy in Gulliver, Michigan, Larry in Bloomingdale, Michigan, Jennifer in Tecumseh, Michigan, and Laura tuned in from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, we have another question coming in from Joshua, who says, do we know where the glaciers were during that time? Were they in the lower peninsula? Um, any idea around that? And I'm happy to go to whomever feels uh, most prepared to answer the question, I guess. Yeah. Brendan, you know, I'll, I'll take a shot at it. Yeah, so it's we're not 100% sure where they were, but it does seem to be that most of the lower peninsula is, un, is exposed uh, from under the ice. So we think that the uh, upper peninsula is still covered. And, uh, you know, there's a large pro-glacial lake on the edge of that uh, glacier. So the Great Lakes aren't formed exactly as they look now but most of the mitten is probably uncovered. Yep. Okay. And we have a pretty good question, I think, coming in from Deb, who says, I own property along the St. Joe River, just a few miles from Belson. How deep are these artifacts? Tom? These artifacts are, um, uh, well, it was, it's curious at the Belson site, uh, there was part of this site, Part of the Clovis material was high enough up that the plow actually brought it to the surface. Uh, so quite a bit of the uh, assemblage is actually surface finds by me. And when they started turning up, I made, a, I started shooting them in with a GPS and um, I made a map, a two meter square that I could use as an overlay on Google Earth. And um, when we started to see a pattern uh, that's the information that we used, uh, you know, basically to figure out where to where to dig. Um, but at that point, the question was, was there undisturbed material under the plow zone? And, and uh, we we're very happy to find out that, yeah, that we are. Um, mm -hmm. As far as the depth, we're down, oh, I'm going to say 35, 40 centimeters is a layer where where we find most of the stuff but last fall we ended up we were down 90 some centimeters and still finding stuff that was the pit that brendan is referring to um we had to cover that back up we're going to dig it back up next year and and uh see if we can't finish it but yeah it's wow. just below the plow zone all right. Well, geez, you don't have to dig very far then, Deb. Uh, so Rick uh, wants to, or Rick has a comment rather, that is some pretty detailed painstaking work that you're doing to track each tiny piece. The 3D map you showed of the site was great. Um, I did want to ask you guys a little bit about sort of the technology that happens, uh, you know, once you get these specimens back to the lab. Uh, but we, we have so many questions coming in from our audience. So I want to make sure that we're giving priority to those as well. Um, so Sean has a pretty basic question. What is Clovis technology? Is it just the big spear points? Um, I think it's kind of, you know, valuable to maybe just reiterate that. Um, Tom, you want to take this one? Well, uh, in some circles, Brendan was known as the Texas Clovis guy, so I will defer. All right, got it. Brendan, what do you got? Uh, yeah, it is a very large spear point, um, essentially. It's made in a very specific way, and it's um, essentially, well, our window into the past, we've just got a bunch of stone tools. We don't have any of the organic debris, and so we really see it as a symbol of those people, probably because that's all we have. But yeah, it's a very large spear point, probably thrown with an atlatl. So that's a spear thrower. 
Mm -hmm. You can imagine those toys that you play with your dog where you put the tennis ball in the back of a cup and you throw it and the ball goes really far with very little effort. Mm -hmm. You can actually just attach a spear to the end of one of those and you can throw the spear very far with little effort as well. Wow. Um, and, you know, they had other they used stone tools for more than just spear points. They also had knives and um, and perforators and scrapers and uh, and all sorts of other tools. But the spear point is the distinctive uh, artifact for sure. Okay. And Joshua wants to know, do we know how far in Michigan the Clovis people traveled? Do we expect to find more sites? Any insight on that? I believe uh, that there will eventually find Clovis sites in other parts of, of uh, lower Michigan. Uh, I believe that some of them are just buried so far that the plow hasn't brought them to the surface. Uh, we're trying to establish a criteria um, that kind of fits the Belson site and uh, use that as kind of a forward modeling project and uh, do some test units around the county. Um, there's, there's just a ton of work to be done. But yeah, I believe that Clovis uh, had traveled up here and could be found in different places. How far? We just don't know. Right. Everybody's got to pull out a shovel, do their part. <laughs> so um, uh, Andrew wants to know, was the total station uh, used to map the locations of tools in the 3D model? Um, Brendan, I wonder if you can speak to that? Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's exactly correct. Um, every single flake or piece of cultural debris that came out of the, the excavation was shot in uh, with that total station. And yeah, it's a laser measuring machine. So we get a an extremely precise laser laser measurement that allows us to reconstruct that ancient campsite. All right, cool. Um, and we are kind of getting close. We're actually a little over time, uh, but always a good problem to have when we have lots of engagement and questions coming in from our audience. Um, but Tom, I really just want to make a, a point to ask you about the sort of team aspect of all of this. You know, we saw multiple people in that segment and we didn't interview or feature all of them, but that doesn't mean that their work wasn't really integral and important um, in this research. So I wonder if you can talk a little bit and maybe give a shout out to some of the other folks folks who made a big difference in this research and in this ongoing uh, work that you all are doing? Oh, absolutely. Uh, we have Jeff Brown. He's from the Sturgis area. Uh, he's a well-seasoned archaeologist. Uh, he's come out and, and helped us immensely. Uh, Jason Patnode, a local collector, uh, left me a note on a rock one day with, uh, with his <laughs> contact information. And he, he uh, as an archaeologist, if you leave me a note on a rock, I I'll get back to you. Um, <laughs> Jason was a huge help. Uh, my good friend, uh, Joe Maris, a local archaeologist, donates his time. Uh, he recently retired. And uh, last but not least, uh, Ed Quigley. Ed and I worked together, retired from the same company, and Ed's been there since day one. Uh, I think Brendan would affirm that we consider Ed Quigley the master of the trowel. Um, so, yeah, we have a lot of uh, local archaeologists that are have been just indispensable, helped us immensely. So shout out to them. Awesome. And Brendan, I want to ask you a little bit, you know, about Tom and some of these other folks, what their role in all of this has really shown you or demonstrated about the potential for citizen scientists to play a really important part in scientific discovery and pretty rigorous research. Oh, absolutely. I mean, none of this was is possible in any way without Tom's original research, his not just the finds, but his dedication. He came to us with a full data map uh, of his finds taken with GPS locations. He understood what the technology was already and was able to find the correct archaeologist um, to work with. And, you know, um, Tom's site director, archaeologist, um, you don't have to learn this stuff in the classroom. You can learn it in the field. And now that we've been in the field for several years with professors uh, uh, from universities all over, uh, all of our guys in the field have gotten a, a, a real first class education. Mm -hmm. And I, I kind of just want to end on asking you both, you know, as this is, like you said, a multi-year project, um, what's next in terms of what you're working on, maybe what you're hoping to uncover or figure out as it relates to the Belson site? Um, Tom, we'll go back to you first. Well, uh, as the data 
continues, uh, you know, our work in the lab every year from and processing stuff from the previous year's excavation. Um, like Brendan said, it's starting to show different activities on the site. You know, we find a lot of scrapers and scraper retouch flakes. Well, somebody was scraping hides there. We find a lot of primary uh, or refurbishment flakes. Well, somebody was refurbishing their tools. We find a lot of tiny little pressure flakes. And somebody was resharpening as they were cutting up game. So I think the main thing is just to continue collecting data. Um, and it's adding more and more fascinating layers to the site. Uh, we, we now have at least two um, Clovis occupations and another later Pleistocene occupation with some really exotic chert from Kentucky. As I say, the more we dig and the more uh, Brendan works with the data, uh, the more the uh, site tells as far as stories about what was going on. Fascinating work. Absolutely. Um, and Brendan, before we get to you on that, we do have a couple more questions trickling in. And it seems like folks really want to know, are there any other confirmed paleo sites in Michigan? One person's asking in the UP specifically, what do we know about that? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, the other big one is the Ganey site, okay. uh, dug by uh, Professor Wright and uh, local archaeologist Don um, Simons. Don Simons. Yep. So, and that was the previously the oldest site. There's also a site called the Butler site right around there. So there were a, a, a scattering of them. Um, they're all several hundred years after the Belson site. And of course, the they're probably the direct descendants of the of the Belson people, um, who of course became you know all of the descendants of all the Native Americans that uh, are around today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Brendan, I want to put that question to you that I asked Tom a moment ago in terms of, you know, your research. Um, I know just from emailing both of you over the last several months in relation to this story, you both have a lot going on. Um, when it comes to the Belson site or any other archaeological research that you have underway, what's next for you? What's next on the docket? Well, for the Belson site, we're just going to keep plugging along, doing what we're doing, um, going methodically, uh, mm -hmm. you know, through the soil. We're always looking for new sites. Um, you know, there was a question about somebody else who lived on the St. Joe. Um, if you think you've got archaeology and you live in that area, you know, contact Tom or myself and we'd love to see, we'd love to check it out. So we're Is always looking for new sites. Is there a seasonal sort of window though? Like right now, I imagine, has the site been put to bed for the season? Yeah, the winter in Michigan uh, yeah. is prohibitive for field research. So <laughs> yeah, we'll start back up in the spring. Got it. All right. Uh, well, it is about that time to wrap up another edition of the Great Lakes Now episode premiere party. But don't forget, you can head over to greatlakesnow.org to dive deeper into that archaeological segment that we just saw and learn about all of the other cool segments and features that we have coming out on the website all the time. And make sure to check out this uh, podcast that has to do with prehistoric caribou that was done recently by our friends over at Points North from Interlock and Public Radio. And also, if if you haven't gotten your archaeology and ancient artifacts fix, you can check out the Iceman Reborn special from our friends over at Nova. So murdered more than 5,000 years ago, Utsi the Iceman, who is Europe's oldest known natural mummy, miraculously preserved in glacial ice, his remarkable intact remains continue to provide scientists, historians, and archaeologists with groundbreaking discoveries about a crucial time in human history. You can learn more about that story over at PBS's Nova. And I'd like to bring my guests back today just to give them a warm thanks. So we have University of Michigan archaeologist Brendan Nash. Brendan, thank you so much for your time and expertise. Well, thank you so much. It's really a fantastic experience. Great video. So thank awesome. you very much. Thank you. We also have Tom Talbot, who is a self-taught researcher who found the first Clovis spear point back in 2008 in the fields of a farm over in southwest Michigan. Tom, it was really great to have you with us. Thank you so much. This was a pleasure, and uh, I thank you because it helps get the word out locally uh, that we have this here, a little nugget of history that's our own. Thank you. 
Absolutely. And also from uh, our viewing audience, thank you so much for all of the thoughtful questions, all of the comments, everybody chiming in and engaging so wonderfully during this episode premiere party. Jan says, miigwech. Thanks all. Uh, very informative. Becky says, thank you. Damien says, very cool. Keep on digging. Suzanne says, I'll volunteer to help. Awesome show. And Elizabeth says, excellent show. Thank you to everybody who is tuning in and asking great questions tonight. And a big thank you also to our co-host for this watch party. So let's pull up that map graphic while I name off everybody who helped us out by co-streaming and sharing out this event. We, of course, have Detroit Public Television. We have Circle of Blue in Traverse City, Michigan, WNMU TV, PBS in Marquette, Michigan. We've got WBGU in Bowling Green, Ohio, the University of Michigan Museum of Anthropological Archaeology in Ann Arbor, Michigan. We've got PBS Western Reserve in Kent, Ohio, WPBS TV in Watertown, New York, the Michigan Learning Channel, and Planet Detroit. And we also have been streaming out on our Great Lakes Now YouTube channel. I also want to make sure that I give a warm thanks to our team over at Detroit Public Television. We have Dean Underwood, who has been manning things behind the scenes and making this whole event happen tonight. We've got Colleen O'Donnell, uh, Mila Murray, Jordan Wingrove, Lana Contardi, and Rob Green. Thank you so much for tuning in for another Great Lakes Now episode premiere watch party. And until next time, we'll see you out on the lakes.